Hello, it's Bruce Williams again, and today I'd like to present the eighth lecture in my series of the Selected Gross Pathology of Non-Human Primates. And today we're going to talk about the liver and the pancreas. But before I do that, I would like to thank my colleagues and friends, and especially recognize a number of people, including Ann Lewis, Lois Colgan, Gary Baskin, and Ed Dick, for supplying so many of the images that I've used in this lecture. Without them, this lecture would not be possible. Okay, we're looking at a very enlarged yellowish liver with rounded edges. It looks extremely fatty to the point almost if you touched it, it would fracture. And this is the type of liver that you would see in a flavivirus infection called yellow fever. This particular disease is a zoonotic disease of humans and non-human primates, which is transmitted by mosquitoes in tropical areas of South America, Africa, and Central America. While the disease is generally subclinical in old world monkeys, it has high mortality in new world monkeys and stories abound of animals in outbreaks falling dead from the trees. It causes a typical hemorrhagic fever with widespread petechial hemorrhages due to the extensive liver necrosis and subsequent disseminated intravascular coagulation. Necrosis within the liver is primarily mid-zonal and there are a couple of changes histologically that are very characteristic of this disease. Necrotic hepatocytes contain councilman bodies, which are eosinophilic round to oval inclusions within the cytoplasm, which are really just cytosegrosomes, or the attempt of the hepatocyte to survive by recycling of feed parts of the cell. Rarely nuclei may contain inclusion bodies, which are known as torus bodies. These are not viral particles, but they're composed of proteins and lipoproteins. And this is more commonly seen in, uh, in monkeys than humans. The overall change that we see in the liver, the amount of fat, is the result of severe degeneration throughout the liver. Necrosis is in the mid-zonal area, degeneration is throughout the rest of the lobule, and sick hepatocytes can take in fat, but they can't complex it and resubmit it back into the bloodstream as VLDL. So the fat tends to accumulate in the liver. You also see in these animals who are uh, not eating, you'll see fatty changes secondary to epoxia and acute tubular necrosis. The story of the establishment of the Panama Canal is largely the story of Major Walter Reed, and I have been blessed for the last 30 years to work here at Walter Reed Army Medical Center as part of my service to the military, to the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology, and today to the Joint Pathology Center some of the original materials that were submitted by Major Reed over a hundred years ago still reside in the repository at the Joint Pathology Center. Okay, moving on to another disease of New World primates. Here is a marmoset with profound icterus. Back in the late 1980s, early 1990s, a number of zoos around the world, including the National Zoo, had die-offs of calatrichids, which are New World monkeys, marmosets, and tamarind, in which the animals would exhibit marked icterus, subcutaneous and intramuscular hemorrhages, a large discolored liver and spleen, and hepatic necrosis. Unlike what you see in yellow fever, there were no inclusions in these livers. 
Histologically, there was multifocal coalescing hepatic necrosis, which was predominantly infiltrated by neutrophils and lymphocytes. In addition to necrosis in the liver, there was also necrosis within the gastrointestinal tract, adrenal cortex, spleen, and within the abdominal lymph nodes, and rarely these animals had a lymphocytic meningitis and perivasculitis. The disease was called calotricid hepatitis, and the mystery was finally solved by Dr. Dick Montali and the crew at the National Zoo uh, around 1993. These animals had been infected by an arena virus, which was well known in rodent and human pathology to cause lymphocytic choreomeningitis. This particular virus is endemic in mice worldwide and usually doesn't cause any problem. It's an innocuous arena virus. The problem is that in a number of rodents, including hamsters and people, uh, it can't be cleared and then you get uh, severe inflammation throughout the body as a result of inappropriate clearance and vasculitis due to persistent antigen antibody complexes in high numbers. Well, this disease, with the exception of the uh, meningitis, is very different, but it turns out it's the exact same arena virus, and these primates in zoo colonies were being fed pinky mice, immature mice, um, as part of their environmental enrichment. And back in the late 18, uh, 1980s and uh, 1990s, uh, pinky mice were not checked for anything, and, and they're well known to contain a number of, of viruses and, and bacteria, and over the years it spread a number of agents to, uh, to zoo primate collections. Now the uh, pinky mice industry is flourishing, but it's highly regulated, and arena viruses are one of the viruses that you will not get in your shipment of pinky mice, and this uh, particular uh, uh, condition is rarely seen today as a spontaneous finding um, because, as we said before, non-human primates are very happy to uh, kill rodents that they catch in their enclosure and eat them. At this point, one of the uh, things I'll do is we're just going to go through some livers. I'm looking at a bunch of little white dots and maybe some bigger white dots because a lot of the liver diseases grossly look somewhat the same. And uh, maybe you can get a grasp for uh, the different ones, but it's one that uh, I really have a lot of trouble with just looking at grossly. But we'll mention a couple of things. And uh, here is a liver that is enlarged. We have variably sized, slightly raised white dots throughout the liver. They are elevating the overlying capsule and some of them are coalescing. This is what is often seen with hot gram-negative bacilli, a wonderful picture of gram-negative sepsis. And this could be a number of different conditions. Um, one of the ones that is also transmitted by rodents is uh, Francisella tularensis. And uh, Francisella tularensis, like all the hot gram-negatives, really likes uh, lymphoid tissue. And so it starts out in the ileum, it starts out in the mesenteric lymph nodes and the spleen, going after the, the uh, white pulp, eventually spreading into the red pulp of the spleen. And uh, uh, when it is burrowing into the wall of the, of the ileum, gobbling up all the lymphoid tissue, eventually it's going to get into those portal vessels and it's going to shoot into the liver. There's really nothing that it likes in the liver, but it's going to set up shop and cause necrosis and abscessation and death. Usually this is a result of contact with rodents. It might be due to uh, uh, rodent contamination of food and water, and it can be tick-borne as well. So there's a number of, of ways that uh, an animal could, be, uh, could come in contact with tularemia. Most facilities keep a very close eye on rodents. All trap rodents are checked for a wide range of, of viruses and bacteria. This could be any of the other uh, 
hot gram negatives. This could be Yersinia, uh, could be Salmonella, um, any of those which are potent will cause a very similar lesion. These particular nodules are a little bigger. It's a little more evidence of chronicity. There is fibrosis of the capsule, and this is one that will also ruin your day. This is tuberculosis, Mycobacterium tuberculosis. We've already talked about it when we looked at the respiratory system. And this is not a very common presentation um, in uh, uh, monkeys with tuberculosis, but it strongly suggests that a abscessed lymph node or perhaps an abscess, uh, excuse me, a granuloma in the lung has ruptured and has spilled its contents into a blood vessel and has gone all over the body. And in rare cases of mycobacteriosis or tuberculosis, I should say, in uh, macaques, you can see lesions in just about any organ, including the liver. Rhesus monkeys are exquisitely susceptible to TB. Uh, other macaques, such as the Cinemalgus macaque, appears to be a little more resistant. Here's a, another little dit dot disease within the liver. And this is one that doesn't cause a lot of problems for the animals, but uh, it can uh, really startle you, make you think about some of the diseases we've talked about. And this is uh, apicomplexin, known as Hepatocystis cocci. And there are a couple of other species, but Hepatocystis cocci uh, is the most common. And you will see characteristic granulomatous and eosinophilic hepatitis um, with protozole mericysts throughout the liver. The cysts within the liver are the first generation merons. The second generation is within erythrocytes. And these are the ones that form gametes or picked up by biting mages who transmit the disease. It really doesn't cause any problem for the animal, but uh, it could interfere with research, especially that on the, uh, on the liver. This is not a, a fantastic picture. Um, actually, it's not a very good picture at all. But uh, if we were a little closer, we would see that there is uh, mild fibrosis and inflammation surrounding the bile ducts. And this is a, uh, a condition that is caused by a microsporidium parasite, generally is seen in immunosuppressed animals. So these animals are concurrently affected with simian lentivirus. Um, it is a, an agent that is also seen in immunosuppressed people, known as enrocytozoan mianuzi. Uh, it affects the, the mucosal epithelium of the intestine, as well as the biliary epithelium and uh, is a sign of severe impairment of cell-mediated immunity. Non-human primates are also susceptible to a related microsporidian, uh, encephalidozoan cuniculi, which uh, causes lesions in the kidney and the, uh, uh, and the brain, especially in immunosuppressed animals. Microsporidia are pretty much, not always, but pretty much restricted to uh, immunosuppressed primates. Here's a trematode parasite, or a fluke, which is in the family of Dicrocilidae and it inhabits the bile ducts of New World monkeys, including capuchins, squirrel monkeys, marmosets, and TD monkeys. And the size of the fluke as compared to the size of the bile duct um, predisposes the bile duct to fibrosis, inflammation, and occasionally biliary obstruction. There's no damage in the surrounding liver except for some fibrosis extending from these markedly dilated bile ducts. It does not appear to cause any damage as it travels through the uh, hepatic parenchyma on its way to the bile duct. The name of this particular parasite is Athesmia foxi.
Here's a liver lobe from a chimp. There are two large, somewhat fibrotic neoplasms, and this is hepatocellular carcinoma. The number of things that will cause hepatocellular carcinoma in uh, uh, non-human primates and, and great apes, a number of toxins, including aflatoxin, cycad toxin, and atrosamines. But one of the big problems, especially in chimpanzees, is that they can also be, as well as in people, they can be caused by uh, the hepatitis B virus. And chimps are often infected uh, subclinically with hepatitis B and hepatitis C. So uh, remember that connection, hepatitis B and neoplasms in non-human and human primates. Uh, Cholelis, or cholelithiasis, here's a gallbladder which is distended, filled with a number of, of cholelis. Uh, gallstones are not uncommon. About 1% of baboons will have cholelis, probably an equal number of macaques. They can be due to dietary uh, dietary related or they can be uh, spontaneous due sort of to the chemical nature of digestion in some individual animals. Uh, people tend to overlook a lot of colas because you, when we think about gallstones we think more about the urinary stones and how hard they are. Um, gallstones tend to have a very squishy uh, consistently like like candy or caramels um, and they don't just jump out at you. The other thing is that you can also see them as a very dark greenish black concretion um, histologically in gallbladders and uh, a lot of people just sort of skim over them and don't pick them up for what they are. So regardless of the species that you're looking at, when you get to the gallbladder, slow down a little bit, look in the lumen and if you see a greenish black concretion, you're probably dealing with a cololith often overlooked on histologic examination of the gallbladder. Okay, moving on to the pancreas. I only have a, a couple of uh, diseases to talk about here in terms of gross pathology. Here is a, uh, a section of pancreas with severe hemorrhage and necrosis. And this is a very interesting condition in uh, immunosuppressed lentiviral infection, uh, infected macaques, which is caused by simian adenovirus 23, and it causes devastating uh, necrosis of the pancreas to the point that histologically you can't see any or very few remaining acinar cells. It's just a great wasteland of necrosis. But one thing that does hang around is the large adenoviral inclusions. So uh, this is always an interesting uh, case. comes up every once in a while on the Wednesday slide conference and uh, people don't know what it is because there's nothing to look at except adenoviral inclusions. So after you've seen it once or twice, you tend to realize this is what happens with simian adenovirus 23. Okay, the last uh, lesion of the pancreas that I'm going to mention is one that is seen generally in uh, older and uh, obese uh, macaques. It's often associated with, uh, with diabetes or at least severe uh, insulin resistant. And, and I want you to look at these little white areas in the pancreas. And these are areas that were previously islets. This is pancreatic islet amyloidosis. Um, in addition, the islet amyloid polypeptide, which is produced in this animal, goes after the islets in two ways. One, it simply crowds them out. It is sort of a, a it's an amyloid looking waxy material and just the volume and the consistency, uh, consistency of that causes atrophy of the uh, of the cells of the islet not just the beta cells but all of the cells and squeezes them out the other thing is just the presence and the manufacture of this particular uh, uh, material IAPP um, is toxic to beta cells So we've looked at, uh, this is independent of the systemic amyloidosis that very commonly affects the intestine, liver, spleen, and, uh, and kidney of uh, macaques. So you can see that in uh, uh, both of them, 
or all of them in a, a very old animal with concurrent diabetes and chronic inflammatory disease, but um, this is one that you want to think of as a, a standalone form of amyloidosis in macaques. Okay, well that concludes our, uh, uh, our lecture on the liver and pancreas in macaques. I look forward to seeing you again uh, at our next lecture, which we're going to talk about the skin of the non-human primate. Thanks so much for your attention, and uh, we'll see you next time.